Oh, thank you, everybody, for that lovely, warm welcome. And um, I have been to New Zealand many times, and um, I don't come to expect a warm welcome, because I do always appreciate it when I'm away from home and on the other side of the world. Um, it is fascinating to see that the topic of school readiness is drawing so much attention here in New Zealand, um, and I think it would be exactly the same at home. So um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, the broad issues around school readiness. I'm going to describe to you um, a way of not doing school readiness. So I am going to share some policy from the Early Years Foundation stage in England. Please don't get depressed. Um, <laughs> I know I do. Uh, I know that you've recently been engaging with a curriculum refresh of Tifariki here in New Zealand. So I'm just sending you some warning shots of what not to do, okay, when, when, the, when the new framework comes out, the new ideas come out. Um, and I'm also going to share with you some perspectives from one of my doctoral students who has just finished doing her thesis, um, because Charlotte's thesis brings to us, most importantly, the voices of young children, and I think it's really important that they are um, here in this space. Now, I am probably the worst person on the planet to talk to you about school readiness for the simple reason that on my very first day of primary school, at the age of about four and a half, um, I ran away, <laughs> uh, which was quite an accomplishment because my house was probably at least four or five K away from the village school. So this is why I ran away. I could already read. And the books in my classroom, some of you may remember the Janet and John books. OK, so really, Janet and John didn't do it for me. I um, didn't like the smell of the lunch that was already wafting into the classroom. I especially didn't like the toilets because there were spiders in there. And being a very imaginative child, um, I knew that where you found spiders, you also found ghosts. So um, there was simply no way that I was going to stay in school, took myself off home. Much to my annoyance, the head teacher, who was called Miss Pickles, um, came to my house and demanded I was returned to school. Um, and my mother said, could she just stay at home the rest of the day to calm down and I would go back the next day. And there began my career in education, some of it against my will. Um, and I remembered that story because it wasn't just that I wasn't ready for school. I didn't really see the point of school. Um, and I'm sure there are many other people who might share those, um, share those sentiments. Right, so debating readiness for school. I am not going to give you any clear recipe. I wouldn't do that. New Zealand is a very different context. Uh, there is much difference, much diversity. Um, a very, very profound emphasis on the importance of culture and sharing and understanding cultures. But what I can give you um, is hopefully some things that we all need to pay attention to, both from the perspective of teachers, of families, of communities, and especially of children. So here are some of the key questions. School readiness is understood in different ways according to where you are standing, which pair of glasses, which lenses you are looking through to understand school readiness. Um, I'm going to talk about to you about this recently constructed thing in England, which is called the School Ready Child, and to show you how, how to create a school ready child from an English perspective. Um, I want to talk to you about resilience and vulnerability. Much um, research, much commentary back home is talking about this idea that if we get it wrong at age four or five or six or whatever age school, um, the school transition takes place, then this is going to affect children negatively for many years to come. So I want to contrast this discourse of vulnerability with a discourse of resilience. Um, and finally, as I say, I want to talk about what children think and say. So here are three perspectives to start with. Um, so I want to think about children as learners, their dispositions, interests, and motivations, and how they figure in the school readiness discourse. Um, the home, the school, the communities, our preschools and our schools, 
and all of the adults in those settings of the homes, communities, and preschools. So this idea of the different perspectives comes from some work in the United States of America by Christopher Brown. And he argues that we can't just see school readiness through the lens of policy, which is the fourth perspective that I'm going to offer you today. Um, because policy gives us one version of what we want the child to be and we want, what we want readiness to look like. And Christopher Brown's work um, argues very strongly that we have to understand readiness from these different perspectives because there are so many discourses and practice, practices that are coming into this space. We need to understand the materials and resources that people have access to in their communities, in their preschools, and in the schools because all of these things change um, when the child makes the transition from preschool to school and indeed makes different transitions throughout life. So I've used the image of a kaleidoscope because um, a, kaleidos a kaleidoscope is an image of complexity. And the minute you turn a kaleidoscope, just even a fraction of a centimeter, the picture changes. So my images that I've been working with uh, recently have been images around the idea of light, color, kaleidoscopes, um, and complexity. So I'm going to think first of all about policy because we all work with policy. Sometimes I feel I sit under rather an oppressive regime when I think about uh, policy back in England. And I think policy works in two ways. On the one hand, Popovitz tells us that policy involves state monitoring, regulation, and control. But the benefits of policy for early childhood education, I'm sure you will all agree that in the last 20, 25 years, policy has become, has acted as a very powerful lever for funding, change, and transformation. So the attention that is paid to early childhood education is positive in the sense that um, there has been so much additional funding in the UK um, in order to support high quality early childhood education. But policy is always a multi-headed beast. Uh, policy serves different masters, different, um, different intentions. And the important thing about policy is that it always expresses a certain logic and it makes assumptions about the, the, those communities I've just talked about. It makes assumptions about parents, families, and communities. It makes assumptions about children, and it makes an awful lot of assumptions about early childhood teachers and practitioners. Um, so, what I'm, so the early years foundation stage gives us a policy logic that tells us that learning and development are predictable, ordered and generalizable. I would say that there is not as much emphasis on community difference and diversities in the early years foundation stage as there is here in New Zealand and especially here in Tepariki. Um, so concepts such as readiness, transitions and progression are constructed from the perspective of policy logic. And what I'm seeing now in England especially is a narrative from policy, from policy that is getting further and further away from what we know about readiness and transitions from research. So there is a real dislocation in England at the moment. And again, I hope that, that your political leaders, I hope that um, the, the academic community here listen to each other and talk with each other to avoid this polarization uh, for the simple reason that it is not in the best interests of children or families or communities. Okay, so I guess what we would like to happen is that transitions would take place as a smooth and seamless process. Um, but transition is not just about the, the last weeks of kindergarten or the first week, the very first weeks of schooling. Um, what we know from research is that transitions take place, they are experienced over a period of time. Um, they don't in just involve learning what to do. They involve children learning how to be in a different setting. And especially the dominant mode of who they have to learn to be 
is becoming a pupil. So it isn't just about a point in time. So in England, it would be at the end of July, you are in your preschool. At the beginning, beginning of September, you are in year one of the national curriculum. So it isn't a matter of time. It is a matter of many, many different forms of transitions and many different types of changes. So I have summed these up um, as physical spaces and locations, materials and how they're used, rules and expectations. As you can see, this, this picture is from Charlotte's thesis. Rules and expectations suddenly become very important. Play and playtimes change, relationships change. Research tells us that there are many different curriculum demands and expectations, and the role and presence of family members change. I'm sure um, here it, it is the case that uh, family members and friends, when they come to pick up children from kindergarten, they can come into the playground. They may even be able to come into the setting uh, to talk with the practitioners, with the teachers. Um, we just had a really interesting case at home where so many parents are now coming into the classroom and demanding to talk to the teacher about their child that schools are putting up signs saying no teachers pass the school gates. So they are keeping families, uh, sorry, no parents pass the school gates. They are keeping families at arm's length. Okay, so again, um, just, just think about that as uh, demands that are made here as well. Um, so you see that there are there are lots of things that are happening around the, the concept of transition, and therefore the idea of readiness needs to be related to all of these different things that are happening. Um, so we can't define readiness in terms of a set of particular outcomes or even a set of dispositions because the complexity here is enormous. So vulnerability and resistance. Um, there is a very, very strong discourse of vulnerability, as I've just said. Um, children who are apparently not ready will, may be vulnerable, anxious. They may experience transition as negative. Much research tells us that this will impact upon their well-being and attainment, their sense of belonging, and that feelings of anxiety during the transition period can endure over time and adversely affect children's learning, their capabilities, and inevitably their learning outcomes further down the line. Uh, feelings of difficulty, anxious, anxiety, and particularly fear of getting it wrong. That list of rules, I think, is anxiety provoking in terms of, yeah, fear of getting it wrong. A different discourse tells us that children who are ready are capable of adapting to change they are resilient to changes. They're aware of what they need to do, what adaptations need, need to be made. They may experience transition as post-positive, welcoming new challenges. Now, I would like to suggest that children can be both of those things. They can go in and out of feelings of vulnerability and anxiety, and they can go in and out of feelings of, okay, I can do this. I know what to do, I've got to grips with this, I've made new friends, um, there are interesting things happening here. Um, and it, again, it is not a single point in time transition that this flow of going in and out may take place over many months of this transition. Um, in terms of thinking about those three sites in which readiness is constructed, we also are told that there have to be changes in the child in, all, in order to become the school-ready child, and changes in family practices. So, for example, in England, our two-year-old children have a health check which is carried out by health visitors, and that is supposed to be discussed with the adults in the setting. They then have an assessment between around about four and a half and five years old. Now, the health check and the five-year-old assessment can both be the trigger points for interventions. And those interventions will often be centered around helping to make the child more school ready. And those interventions may not just be with the child and the teacher, but they can come directly into the space of the family as well. So it's not just children who are being positioned, it is the families are who, who are being positioned in terms of 
constructing or helping to construct the school ready child. Um, and the changes in the preschool, we know, for example, a lot of research in England and elsewhere is telling us already that practice is changing significantly in the preschool. So less play, less time for play, less time for freely chosen play activities, and more time in adult-led, adult-directed activities. So the idea is that you are taking time away from what we know is good preschool practice in order to help to construct school readiness, regardless of whether this is appropriate for children between the ages of four and five in England, but those children may be between the ages of five and six in other countries, depending upon the point at which transition takes place. So how school readiness is constructed is really important because it is affecting not just the child, it's also affecting potentially the family. And it is certainly affecting um, people like yourselves, the practitioners who in England are placed under considerable pressure to shift their practice into something that looks much more like what uh, primary school practice. And I'm sure you're aware of push down pressures from primary school, push down pressures from secondary school as well. Um, one of my doctoral students is doing his research in a secondary school. He is a, a, a physics teacher. He's done an analysis of the A-level physics curriculum for 17 and 18-year-old um, young people in his school and the physics curriculum in university. And what was being taught in year one and two university is now being taught at A-level. So this pushdown is coming um, at all stages. It's not just an, an early years pushdown. Right, I'm, going to, I'm just going to pause there because I should have said at the beginning, if there's anything, if you want to shoot your hand up and ask a question or a comment, um, I'm very happy to be interrupted. Does this sound familiar? Yes? Are you sharing some of these anxieties? Oh, dear. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, um, and I think those of you who know about the, the upcoming what's being called the baby PISA. I think we all have even more reasons to be a little bit more anxious about what that might throw into the mix in terms of school readiness. Right, I am, this, this is the hard bit, because I'm now going to talk to you about the early years foundation stage in England. Um, the framework that we have in England is like Tafariki. It is from birth to five. Um, so uh, as soon as children come into a setting, they might be six weeks old, they're already uh, not subject to, but they're already within the framework um, of the early years foundation stage. So this is the lens through which uh, practitioners are looking at children's learning, at children's development, and at their own practice. So in the foundation stage, um, by the age of five, practitioners are required to assess children against 17 early learning goals. Um, they have to use their judgment to decide whether each child has met their level of attain of, has met each learning goal and whether they are at one of three stages. You can be emerging, you can be at the expected stage for your age, or you, may, you might be exceeding what is expected for the typical five-year-old. Um, each... Uh, practitioners must indicate whether they're meeting expected levels, if they're exceeding expected levels, but or not yet reaching the expected levels, which is emerging. Now, this concept of emerging, to me, is interesting and very powerful. On the one hand, I think as human beings, we are always emerging. We are always becoming something else, becoming, uh, becoming a PhD student, becoming a better teacher, becoming a, um, you know, a, a parent, or all of those different things in our lives. Um, emerging for young children is, is also an important concept, but how I understand emergence, theoretically, is very different from how it's being understood here, because emerging means not yet reaching. So they have, they have switched. The language, language is always a game for me. It's always interesting to read the language. They switch the idea of emerging being something positive. You are on the journey towards understanding 
mathematics or reading or becoming a reader or you're on the journey towards exploring and becoming a geographer, all of those powerful discourses that we use in early childhood because emerging means not yet reaching. So already we have a deficit discourse operating here about children. This deficit discourse gets um, a little bit more problematic. So if you, if you meet your 17 learning goals, you will have a good level of development. And notice the shift of language here, because this is about development, whereas the early learning goals are about learning. So there are lots of tensions in this, in this document. Um, you are expected to, to achieve the, uh, the level within the prime areas of learning um, and the specific level, specific areas of learning. But importantly, the child who has a good level, level of development is this new creature. It is the school-ready child. And this is the language that is used in the early years foundation stage. So you are constructed as the school-ready child on the basis of 17 early learning goals, on the basis of what may be quite subjective judgments from practitioners in the setting. And it may be that a child in one setting could be viewed and understood and talked about quite differently from a child in another setting. Um, like New Zealand, we have many, many newcomers from different parts of the world, uh, some who are coming through choice, some who are coming as refugees in very traumatized and distressed states. And yet the same expectations are there for all children to achieve a good level of development. So let's see some of the criteria for what it means to be um, a school-ready child. Um, this document is from Ofsted, which is uh, your equivalent of Eero, that's right, isn't it? Um, and again, just look at, look at this change of language. So the child who is um, emerging is now the child who may be at risk of delay. So that is the point. Um, this is why I've questioned what does emerging mean? Does it mean working at a lower level of development? Who is in this category and why? And I come back to the point that if your child is assessed as being at risk of delay, the family and the, the preschool becomes the site for one of many different types of interventions. And those interventions will always be focused on helping your child to become school ready. In, the whole intervention industry um, back in the UK is enormous. I don't know if you've got that here or whether it's starting, bubbling up, um, but the intervention industry is enormous. Um, okay, so this is what it looks like. This is the actual documentation. <clears throat> um, and again, we've got different types of language, which I think is somewhat contradictory um, in that we've got descriptions of development, descriptions of learning, and we've got the use of the word attainment. So I have a number of colleagues at work who have got children between the age of about two and five years old, and they sometimes come up to me. One of them came up to me recently and said, oh, he's got a good level of development. Is this all right? He's a two. He's a two. What, is that all right? And I said, yes, good level of development is fine. Nothing to worry about. Um, but this is the discourse it then creates in parents. And you know, what do I say um, about a, a child who's been assessed at one? Well, at the emerging level, at the end of the EYFS, you may have very, very good reasons for being at that level. Um, but it's very worrying when parents say, oh, she's only a one, and she's going into primary school in September. So, you know, discourses for parents are also very powerful. So this is the document you would be working with. Now, I'm just going to give you two, two examples of writing and reading. This is what constructs the school-ready child. So although we have six areas of learning, the two most important areas are language and literacy and mathematics, inevitably, okay? So these are the writing, the typical behaviors that you would be looking for if you were in England to construct the school-ready child. 
Um, and I was discussing these recently with some very eminent psychologists who said these are not even behaviors. Something to be a behavior, it needs to be observable. Um, and what, what, what is happening here is a kind of oversimplification <coughs> of um, writing, reading, and communication as sets of behaviors. But of course, if you're going to carry out an assessment, you must have something observable. You must have something that you can tick to say, I've seen that, I've seen it happening several times. I am confident that this child can continue a rhyming string. What this doesn't tell us is how, again, coming back to the idea of a kaleidoscope, how all of these different skills and interests fit together to create the child who is motivated to read and interested in reading. Similarly, for um, this is the early learning goal for writing. The emphasis on phonic knowledge is profound in England. And I'm not saying that knowledge of phonics is not important to support um, early reading. However, I would question whether children need to be doing drill and skill in phonics before they go to primary school, because that's what we're seeing happening. Um, so these are the outcomes you are looking for. And again, if you're lucky and you demonstrate these outcomes, phew, you are this magical creature. You are this school-ready child. So you can see how policy actually creates things, brings things into being because of the discourse that, it's create, that it creates. So um, what the Early Years Foundation stage does not do just in literacy is see it as a complex social and cultural practice which is multimodal, relational, distributed across people, contexts, and materials. There is nothing in the Early Years Foundation stage about children's competence in uh, using digital modes of communication um, and play. And we know that this is a huge area of children's motivation and interest and engagement. So lots and lots of deficits um, that I could bang on about for ages, but I won't. I must calm down now. <laughs> OK, has anybody worked with the foundation stage? Is this it? We, are, we are on our fourth version between 1999 and 2014 was our last version. Um, so four different versions, which tells you something, I think, about whether we are getting it right for young children um, back in England. OK. So what I want to say is that readiness is much, much more than this. It is about all of these things, playing and learning, what we tend to do is create these dichotomies between the informal practices that we might see in, um, in preschool and the more formal practices that we see, uh, we typically see in primary schools. And I think there is a huge amount of work here to do some blending and some dissolving of these barriers, these, these binaries between formal and informal, between child-initiated and adult-led, um, and whether there is more focus on adult-led led activities, less focus on the child-initiated. Are children moving from everyday concrete activities working with materials to more abstract ideas about mathematics, about reading, writing? Or, or are we, again, creating a false binary between what is concrete and what is abstract? Um, transitions and readiness is about all of these things. It is about the spaces that children have, have it, the movement, the opportunities for movement in and around spaces, the use of time. Um, children are often embodied differently once they put on a uniform. Um, they, they often behave differently once they've got little, little uniforms. Um, and importantly, transitions are about changes in children's identities and status. And that is all often driven by peer relationships and mixing then with older children. So what I want to argue very strongly is that what the foundation stage gives us is a, a very diminished and oversimplified version of this school-ready child. And what we need to be paying attention to is these, the experiences of children and how they construct their own readiness and how they manage transitions. No. 
in a word, um, I would say that your, uh, your, the framing around dispositions is much stronger in Tafariki and in your primary curriculum, because I think you've got much stronger continuity around those concepts as well than, than we have. But it was a good question, because what does dispositions bring? What does the focus on dispositions bring that is missing, for example, in the foundation stage? Okay. Right, so let's go to this idea of um, the fourth perspective. This is Charlotte's unpublished EDD thesis. Are you laughing at the title? Um, uh, the, the children do actually temper that a little bit. Um, and, but I'll tell you why she chose, uh, chose that title as we go along. Um, so what I want to show you from Charlotte's thesis is something about children's voices and children's experiences. What I've given you so far is a kind of macro level understanding of how policy constructs the school ready child and the kind of expectations that we're placing on children to make that transition at whatever age it takes place. Now, most research I've come across on transition has followed the four to five year old child becoming the five to six year old child in year one of, the, of primary school. Charlotte's thesis is different because it took place in an international school in Belgium. And the transition takes place not at age five, but at age six. So these children have already got a whole year in the equivalent of a kindergarten, a whole year more than we would have in England, and a whole year more than you would have in New Zealand. And the important and interesting thing about Charlotte's thesis is that at whatever age this transition takes place, at age five or at age six, very similar issues are coming up for the children. So transition is important. It isn't just that children are more ready when they've been in the European system, when they've been in an international school, it isn't that they're more ready to go to school. Um, they are just that there are just different things, some different things happening for the children. So why have I chosen these two images, one of a pencil case and one of a backpack? Um, Charlotte used some lovely methods with the children. They did a guided tour of maternelle, which is their preschool. That's what the preschool is called and then a guided tour in year one of primary school. Um, so she recorded the children's voices, they drew pictures, uh, they did a tour with two puppets and they were asked to show the two puppets, the different things that were happening in maternelle, the different things that were happening in year one. So very child-friendly methods that the, the children responded to very well. And they were asked to choose images and take photographs of things that were important to them. You wouldn't normally expect to see a pencil case, but um, this is Katie saying why she chose this image of the pencil case. And I want to show you how important materials and materiality is to young children. She said, Katie says, this is a pencil case. Oh, whose pencil case? Is this your pencil case? Yes, well, you need some pencils to put in and, and some a glue stick, and you need like scissors and a pencil. Uh, you really need a pencil, but markers you can sometimes need in case it has to be brighter. And then here you need the uh, ruler because like you have to do straight lines sometimes, or if you don't know how to count up to 20, it will help you a bit. <laughs> so yeah, that's what you need. You mainly need a pencil case, otherwise you can't write and you can't color and things. The first time I had a pencil case, I was wondering what I need to put in. And my mum said, I needed a pencil or a pencil and all that. And another child says uh, very tangibly, I felt sad when I just started primary because I didn't have a pencil case yet because everyone else had it. So can you imagine that, 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 that micro level of transition? where everybody else has got their act together, especially Katie. Um, uh, they've got all their kit and they're ready to roll. But it wasn't just having the kit. It was fear of not having the kit and not having the right kit that mattered. So all of a sudden, children have been used to going into maternelle. They've been used to having all of the um, activities and the experiences and the pencils and the crayons and the paint all laid out for them. 
And suddenly, the transition was about taking responsibility. Um, the image of the bag similarly has, has material significance for Jack. And the children talked about their bags quite a lot. Jack reported that he had to have a very big bag in year one. With Katie then adding, this was because you need like to put more things in, like reading folder, your homework, reading books, library books. You need many things. And not only was the bag significant um, for containing things, the bag was significant in terms of what you did with it. And that's when you come back to the rules of the setting. Um, as soon as the children arrived at their year one class each morning, they hung their own bag on their own desk, then accessed the equipment from their own pencil case. In essence, each child now had his or her own individual workstation. In order to work efficiently there, they were responsible for keeping it sufficiently resourced in terms of equipment in their pencil case and resources in their bag. Okay? So these things have enormous significance, maybe the things that we might miss. And certainly this is not the kind of, um, these are not the kind of events that politicians in England would have any truck with. Because, yes, we have to just get on with phonics. Um, and then readiness will emerge. There's lots of phonics, lots of counting. Okay. Um, the title is in some ways misleading in the sense that Sometimes one little boy is talking about um, how big his maths book is and what a lot of maths there is in his maths book. And he's seeing it as a whole book, not just as a page at a time task to get through. Um, and he's, he, he says that it's actually quite boring. And then he says, no, it's not. It's tiring. And what an interesting flip. What, you know, for him to correct, it's very easy, I think, for children these days to reach for that word. Everything's boring, isn't it? But he said, no, it's tiring. So here was a, you know, a child giving us some insight into this idea of the cognitive load and how that is re represented again through the materials in the setting um, and the demands that are being made on the children. Um, OK. Inevitably, play came up in the children's transition um, from that LNL to year one. So, Katie, we don't play anymore. Play had been replaced with specific work. We don't usually play a lot. We usually write. Now, this is Katie's drawing of her classroom in Maternelle, is on the far side. And then there is a drawing of her work desk. Now, the reason uh, Charlotte writes about this quite a lot in her thesis, because the reason why these two pictures are significant is because Katie talked about in Maternelle, you have, um, you have a, a, a table. You have a tabletop. And many things can happen on the table. It might be drawing or painting or craft. Or you can go and get the Lego or the Duplo and put it on the table. So the, the tabletop becomes a space of possibility in Maternelle. It's part of your repertoire of choice. You can do different things there. The tabletop become, becomes different kind of spaces. Although the tables were very similar in year one, it was no longer a table. It was a desk. And it wasn't just a desk, it was a work desk. Now, Katie wasn't the only child who, um, who drew a picture of a work desk. So the transition to pl from play to work for children isn't just about the activities and the friendships. It's a very material transition in terms of how, what they are expected to do and how they are expected to be. And this is the transition about becoming a pupil. Because in Maternelle, you can go, you can walk around, you can go to the computer, you can go to different activities, you can go to different tabletops. In year one, you go to this desk, because this is where you've got your bag hanging on your desk. This, this identifies your place in the classroom. It also identifies your transition to being a pupil. So these micro perspectives, these micro analyses that the children are giving us through Char Charlotte's thesis, give us um, give us that sort of the child's perspective on what transition looks like and the kind of demands that um, that are placed on them. The children don't always talk about it being boring. Some of the children really like the challenge of being in year one. 
they want to do harder work. Um, I think it's Leanne talks about, I could count up to 10 in maternelle, now I'm learning to count up to 100. And that's a positive thing. You know, sometimes we think that subject knowledge is a contaminant in early childhood. We just want them to play. But knowledge really is power for children. Um, the more knowledge you have, the more stuff you can do with it, um, and the more it also defines your identity and your status. So pay attention to children's drawings, because they are telling us lots and lots of, um, um, lots and lots of interesting things. The other important thing about work is that it provokes new rules that the children have to get to, um, to, get to understand. Sean says, we do like lots of work. And Katie agrees, we work. And Leanne says, it's very strict about work. So work actually brings a whole new set of boundaries, a whole new set of expectations. So it isn't just the simplistic transition from play to work. It is a transition about how you are expected to behave, how you are expected to be in the setting. Oh. She's in place. Yes. But there's no person in her older, in her new picture. What a good comment. And do you know, I'm just thinking about the, the pictures. I think that is a common. I will go back to Sh and talk to Charlotte about that. Um, that is really interesting because you've also got quite a happy little girl over there. But this is something significant. Good, thank you for that. That's an interesting comment. Um, so, when the children are talking about this shift from play to work, importantly, what comes through from Charlotte's data. Um, is that Sean is telling us there's not much playing. Katie says we don't play anymore. Isabel added, play has been replaced with specific work activities. She says, we don't usually play a lot. Uh, we usually write. But Sean was concerned not just with the lack of play. He was concerned with the lack of choice. So again, this is a big, big shift, being told what to do, when to do it, moving from one activity to the other, perhaps without very much space in between. Um, and Sean says it's different, actually, because Mrs. B tells us what to do. And in Mattel, Maternel, it's we can decide what to do. So it wasn't just the play-work dichotomy. Again, this is a simple, too simple a binary to work with. It is, the, it is the removal of choice, which was important. Um, and not only is it that they're telling them what activities to do. But Sean says it's different only because Mrs. B says we're supposed to use the materials. You can't change the pieces of paper into another color. So the art activities now have predetermined outcomes. You can't go to the art table and make something beautiful, creative, um, out of your own head. It's, a, it's an art activity that has specific outcomes. So choice in materials was restricted to what the to the teacher prescribing the resources and what were the most appropriate resources for meeting the desired outcomes. So again, it's, it's this subtlety if we look beneath the data to see what's happening. Um, what comes through from Charlotte's thesis was also this idea of learning to be a pupil, learning to do school. Readiness isn't just about what is in your, your kit bag, it is about essentially your whole orientation to the world. Um, and again, rules, rules are everywhere. And I thought it was just in England. Um, so Katie talks about, uh, she likes doing her work because that means you can then go to the reading area. Um, Bobby says, we're not allowed to choose from here. And Kate says, no, because those books are on the top shelf. It's after work. And when you've done enough work, you're allowed to read a book, but you have to, you have to like really read it. You don't just look at the books. Again, you know, subtle, subtle transitions. You can't hang out, look at the pictures, maybe make up your own story. You've got to really read it. So this transition is about what it means to be a reader, not just what it means to be a pupil, but what it, 
and she says again, you have to learn to read. I can't read any of them. I can just read. I can only read the books that you say, read it yourself. <laughs> so, you know, Katie's got this, this understanding of reading, not reading. Okay, so, and again. Um, and Katie likes the reading area, but it is a place you can go after work. Um, so reading is not considered to be work. It's something that you can do as a reward. And indeed, um, play is something you do as a reward because the system of golden time oper operates in this school. You have to earn your golden time. Do you know what golden time is? <laughs> Nobody knows what golden time is. Oh, a few. Oh, okay. You probably... Right, golden time is instead of having play as a right... Uh, or time for child-initiated, child-led activities, that is not a right. Uh, you have to earn golden time. And golden time is perhaps it's typically given on a Friday afternoon between about half past one, two o'clock, and three o'clock. Um, uh, I have terrible problems with, with golden time for all sorts of reasons, but the particularly insidious thing is that you can lose your golden time as well if you've been naughty. And sometimes if, you're, if your group hasn't done well, the whole group loses golden time. So, yeah, don't go there. Um, <laughs> I'm so pleased that is not part of the New Zealand repertoire. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, again, it's this, this subtlety of the children's experiences, all of these adaptations. And Katie actually, first of all, she expressed a preference for maternelle over year one because she says you don't have to work so much in maternelle. But then she said, but in primary we learn more. Um, she said she enjoyed working in, in year one because this work would help her to go quicker into an adult. Um, she also, and I think this is, a very good, this is very good guidance for teachers everywhere. So Katie suggested that it would be good to play more in year one but concluded that a little bit more playing and a lot of work would be her best solution. So actually, she's not rejecting work. She sees value, purpose. Perhaps she's also seeing something in there about her own readiness to work. Um, so I think this sort of working with binaries of formal, informal, concrete, abstract work, play, is not helpful. I think we need to be maybe thinking about different ways of talking about how we shift practice, what changes we make, and how we help children to make those changes as well. Okay. So here we are. Um, I wanted to talk to you about rules and how important rules are. But most importantly, what the children said in this, um, in this, this piece of research was that they knew what the rules are, but they didn't always know the behavior they had to show in order to get a sticker. They weren't wild about stickers and charts. Um, and again, you know, the sticker provokes the, the, the good pupil. You, you have, when a table's quiet working, you get a sticker for your table, um, and then they get to have gold time. Golden time is, is, is when you play. But what comes up in several places is the children saying, well, I know um, I know I'm supposed to sit quietly, and I know I'm supposed to do good work, but sometimes good work means doing your best handwriting. Sometimes good work means getting all your sums right. Sometimes good work means helping a friend. And so the children are not always clear about how to get a sticker because they're not always clear about what the teacher is looking for, um, which I thought very interesting that six-year-old children can read their environment in such subtle and complex ways. Um, and we all like to know the rules of the setting so we can break them. Right, so here are some things that I really want you, I, I would like you to think about. Because I thought, okay, what transfers across these two very, very different national contexts? What does transfer across different cultures, especially um, different ways of understanding families and communities? Um, so I'm very happy to, to send these to you um, or have them maybe available on the on a website. Um, I think it's really important to have continuity with challenge. 
And although I have spent much of my life researching play and being a very strong advocate for play, um, I am not convinced that children just need more play when they make the transition into year one, because I have seen schools with the very, very best intentions saying, oh, we've got continuity, here's our year one space, we've put sand, we've put water, we've put Lego, but actually it's more of the same. Now, play changes in very profound ways. Children change what they do with play. Um, they change kind of uh, activities. It's much more about identity, status, rules. So if you have the same kind of stuff in year one, children are going to be bored with play. So I think we really need to uh, play serious pay serious attention to how play changes and the kind of... Um, the kind of activities and materials and resources that we need. And again, I come back to um, the importance of play with digital materials, the uses of different media, and also integrating popular culture into children's, um, into, our, into our spaces, because they can all help us to keep up with what children are interested in. They can help us to keep up with their working theories, their funds of knowledge, um, um, their dispositions and what is driving their interests. So serious attention, not more of the same. So how can we sustain free flow play um, after the transition from kindergarten, from preschool into year one? Because I think children do need time for child-initiated activities, but they need continuity with challenge and extension. I know it is... Uh, some things are relatively easy to change, some things are not. If you have a primary school where you have restricted space, um, uh, it's not always easy to have that indoor-outdoor flow that children enjoy when they are in a preschool setting. The children in Charlotte's thesis talked a great deal about a little um, narrow strip outside their classroom, which was, they called it the terrace but there were just small spaces there for them to hang out. There were little tables, there was a little, um, a little arbor where they could go and sit, and they just wanted places where they could sit and chat. They talked a lot about chatting. So can we have spaces, you know, maybe we don't need huge equipment. Maybe children need spaces to hang out, because that's what they, um, they enjoy doing in Charlotte's thesis. Relationships and new friendships come up in nearly every single study I have read on transitions and school readiness. And again, it's a complex mix of children saying, I'm going to miss my friends, or I'm looking forward to meeting new friends. But it's always a space of uncertainty until they have got used to new people around them and created new, created new friendships. So how do we pay attention to relationships? and friendships, and the importance that these hold for children. Time to, le to learn the rules, but perhaps also um, time to contribute to the rules. I sometimes wonder if children create the rules themselves, that they're better understood. Um, changes in children's identities and status, it is about being six, which is very different from being four. It is about being bigger, it is about being a pupil, um, lots of changes in identity and status for them. And again, I think the word that glues together each of these points is time. And I know certainly in England, we are not giving children time. Time to adjust, time for their friendships, time to settle, because we're, we're putting them straight into this conveyor belt of, of um, education. Uh, we know the, the consequences of not paying attention to children's well-being and indeed not paying attention to our well-being as teachers and practitioners. Um, and working with diversity and difference is a constantly evolving journey. Another of my PhD students is um, doing her research in a classroom where there are 26 different community languages. And there are already deficit constructions of what these six, uh, five and six-year-old children cannot do. But Christina's work is showing us that when they are in their, their group time and their, uh, their child-led activities, their negotiation across languages, across boundaries, across cultures, across meaning, again, it is so complex and so dynamic. And they are extremely skilled at it as 
well. So pedagogical approaches, it is not a wholesale shift to adult directed activities. I know when I used to um, go into schools more when I was doing initial teacher education, I was seeing exhausted teachers who'd done 40 minutes of literacy before morning break time, quickly followed by 40 minutes of numeracy because that's the best time for children to learn. So you have to get the hard stuff in before lunch. Um, teachers losing their voices, teachers being exhausted. We do have a problem at home with teacher supply and teacher retention. Um, and I think it is because of the huge demands um, and expectations that are placed upon teachers to teach in ways that are perhaps not consistent with their beliefs, their values, um, and, their, and their teacher education. So level of challenge and extension. How do we get this really complex balance between too much and too little? Um, sometimes we're going to get it wrong. But I think that if we allow time for children to do their child-initiated, child-led activities, we're going to get more glimpses into what Helen's work talk, talks about. Children's funds of knowledge, their working theories, and importantly, their desire to learn because the desire to learn is also the desire to be more competent and more competent. How do we as practitioners work against top-down pushes and push-down pressures? Because I know, again, at home, there are certain risks to teachers if they don't stay on script. It takes a very bold teacher, indeed, um, to stand against some of these very powerful discourses. And finally, an ecological perspective. How do we keep in mind these complex interactions between the child, the home, the preschool and the school, the family and the community. So those are some of the challenges that I'm going to leave you with in New Zealand. When you have solved all the problems, please can you write me an email and I will go hand it to all the hard-pressed teachers back at home. Right, have we got time? I see some people are leaving and I've overrun. Time for questions. Um, right, uh, yes, yes, Le so ideas about learning power, uh, we've also got Carol Dweck's ideas have come back big time into England, and although I would say yes, it's important to read the theory, what we don't need is add-on bits as solutions that do not address the core problems, and that's the difficulty that's happening at home, yeah. Liz, thank you very much for a very stimulating presentation. Uh, there's no doubt, as you're all aware, that readiness is a political issue in New Zealand. I don't think we would have actually had a revisionist society if we didn't have a lot of Ministry of Education language around what they call the pathways. Oh. So, uh, about who and what policymakers listen to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always been an issue yeah. for us in terms of who's researched, what kind of research, and who has the authority, because sometimes that's not related to research at all. And I can hear much of that in what you have talked about um, today around relationships and, and positioning as well. Uh, talking about your 17 learning goals. I think you've raised some very good questions for us to consider. We used to have 165, Helen. Yes. 17 yes. is good. <laughs> well, we're, we're moving from 117 to 20. But the same kinds of issues will, or the questions that you've um, raised are around what we need to keep very strongly in mind is that we have had, and still have, credit-based discourse, whereas we've heard a lot from you about a deficit-based discourse. And so that's something we need to hold on very strongly to in any kind of assessment measures, and I use that word measures advisedly, that come out of us paying more attention 
to the 20 learning outcomes that are ahead of us because we need to avoid that potential intervention industry yeah. and all of that deficit physical that goes with it. So I think, again, it makes me think that we need to hold tight to our aspiration of this confident, competent child. We, we can hear a lot of the competent, confident yes. child in Charlotte's thesis, but it's um, at a very narrow emphasis on, as you said, literacy and numeracy, and, and you can hear that what teacher's value is coming through and what the children say. And as you said, they reflect outcomes that are no longer child chosen. And yeah. I think that, again, is a particular warning for us. So for us, yes, to think about the shift to a ready school, I think that's, um, you've, you've got some very important points on this last slide, and we'll be very pleased to have a look at those. And it, it made me think when you were talking about that the more complex look at play with, with five and six year olds, that wonderful BBC series that many of us would have been watching, you know, The Secret Life of Three, Four, Five, Six Year Olds, and ethical issues aside, we, we do get a real insight into the importance of things that are not work and not literacy outcomes, and so on in the children's uh, relationships and friendships that do link very nicely to work that Southern have done now around. So yes, I want to uh, thank you very much for providing us with all these lenses for school readiness and for firing those warning shots because, as you mentioned, we have got baby keys around the potential to uh, have you propose that New Zealand is part of an OEC um, pilot study and um, I, I don't know, but I think there's many people that are thinking perhaps we should run away on our first day of school. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. I'll start just by posing one question, and that, that is, Liz, that currently we still have um, most children transition as an individual around yes. the age of five. Yep. We have a cohort yes. approach. Yep. And I wondered if you had any advice for us in relation to what you're talking about and a readiness of whether, because we do have a proposal to move to a cohort approach. I, I, yeah, I think a cohort transition does address some of the issues around well-being and relationships and friendships because the children are, are talking about the transition they are moving together as a group some children will go to another school um, but the idea that you're in this together I think is actually quite important these children are very very young yeah ready to go on there. I will be uh, we're on there. Nola. Uh, no, thank you. Um, Liz for getting us uh, thinking again about that idea of who constructs the readiness um, and who's ready. Uh, one of the things that I recall from long ago, maybe Joy covered, there was a there was children said we were being literate, we were being writers in the early yes. childhood setting, yeah. but we do writing. So that sense Ooh, of the right, word. that's powerful. And I must go to Universal Cricket, that's, yeah. that's from long ago, but yeah. that same sense of a child having things done to them mm -hmm. or having that choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Were there many were there many who spoke about Everybody spoke about rules, more or less, or having the same. It, yes, yes, they did. I mean, there were only um, six children in this six study, so it's very, very small scale, very focused. But it's, uh, it's. I think they've given very good provocations for us to think about things like yes. rules yes. from children's perspective. Yeah. I'm curious as to whether you've had anyone who's been looking more at. Yep. British form of school, such as Germany, where school age doesn't start till seven, yep. or the Nordic countries, where you've got one to fifteen for right. um, school yeah. ratios. Whether you've had any chance to, or had anyone make yep. comparisons between the two languages? There's loads, loads of stuff around the Nordic countries. 
Finland are fed up with people saying everything in Finland is wonderful. Uh, so they're rejecting. But um, seriously, every, to every point of, you remember I said we've, got, we've had four versions of the foundation stage in four years. At every point in change, all the early childhood community was jumping up and down and say, make it to six, preferably seven. Mm -hmm. Push it away from five, the whole foundation stage, make it more consistent with uh, continental European countries. That was staunchly resisted by every single education minister that we've had in that 20 year period. But I would also say that the Nordic countries are changing their practice because of OECD and PISA. So you can see these global discourses, how they are creating less space for choice and self-determination. So it's getting harder to think, where do we look to see good practice? Because, because there is so much change going on as a result of global discourses. Yep. And when I tried to do something about that in my area, they actually said, well, if you don't do that, we're not going to come and do the hearing and prison for it. Um, so, yeah. And then, so there doesn't have a discussion go between health and education, and that makes it even more complicated. It, yeah. I, I would say we've got um, some maybe uncomfortable overlaps or discontinuities between those two because education and health see children and families in very different ways. Mm. So the site, when families become a site for intervention, it could be to do with the child's health, it might be around hearing, it might be about language delay, it might be about learning English as an additional language, getting the mother to learn English, English if she doesn't learn it already, because we know that that has a stronger effect on the children's language competence as well. So the interventions can be to do with health, they can be to do with family hygiene, uh, family beliefs and cultural practices, changing those. So a whole raft of interventions, but the family is can, can be constructed as the problem site as well because of those. Can that make an impact on a kind of trusting relationship that you're it to can. try and build up to a family yeah. and support them in the transition yeah. and then you've got all these different things yeah. coming at them yeah. and there kind of be a loss of trust sometimes, I think. And our our flagship best practice children's centres and sure start centres which were set up in the 1990s, 2000s, um, there are very, very few of those left now because that's where parents came together as communities. They came volunt voluntarily. They helped, us, helped each other to sort out problems. They weren't just there to be done to by the professionals. But because of the global economic downturn, that was one of the first things that went from our early childhood provision. There's one over here, and then I'll come to you. Liz, I can see a paper you're going to produce in the future that might have something like um, the era of the workstation <laughs> um, as being uh, telling this kind of story. But here in New Zealand, um, we have a, a work with a number of primary teachers who are actually struggling to understand the disappearance of the desk, let alone workstation. So I'm going oh, to ask, okay. Ninety. And we would call that a modern learning environment or an innovative learning environment. And the desks disappear and the beanbags arrive or whatever else. The post trays, in fact, is usually what people doing inquiries don't you know. But they'll think of it. What's an innovative learning environment? It's, it's the ownership of the post tray, not the desk. Okay. But what I'm yeah. actually really getting at is the preparation for that level of change that desperately wants to understand a very different version of Yep. and structuring the day differently yep. as opposed to in a way that kind of simple binary that we're getting of a primary school that yep. is actually carrying on a tradition of, um, of more prescribed curriculum and maybe worse in the abyss of trying to go to a, a totally open and, you know, I, I think I would see, I think we would see both. I, would, I think we would see quite fluid, open plan spaces where children move around with laptops, with um, 
with tablets, so they might be working in one space with one person for something and then coming back into a larger space. But equally, I would also see a classroom that looks very, very similar to something, anything you would see in the 19th century. And that <coughs> in some schools, technology hasn't changed that. You've got the rows and you've got your tablet. So, you know, you might as well just have your chalk and your slate board because there's been no shift in environment, pedagogy, the idea of the 21st century learner or 21st century education. I think I'm suggesting one stage past that <coughs> in the sense that you might change the environment, yep. you may produce more of the sort of governmentality of the independent learner with very little understanding of a, of a change in, in teacher role yeah. and not the same awareness that, that says very highly uh, you know, what early childhood teachers understand <coughs> is how to operate when there is much more of those kinds of yeah. Well, I've always said if you get it, if you, if you can teach four and five-year-old children well, you can do absolutely anything. <laughs>